increase your oxygen levels? Yes. Um, the first thing that I would do if I were dehydrated is begin to uh, introduce water to my body. Dehydration is to water like a word hypoxia is to oxygen. So those of us whose oxygen levels are too low can instantly, and, and this is my, my own opinion and theory, theory is this, that um, God made oxygen the most important thing in our body, and he made it the most available and easy thing to get. We don't have to haul it. We don't have to buy it. We don't have to clean it. We don't have to prepare it. We simply suck it in. And most of us are not doing that. We're suffering from hypoxia because we're lazy breathers. Just like about 60% of our population are estimated to be in a state of dehydration, which is in a state of slowly dying. Right. So breathe. That's how you do it. You breathe. I have an oximeter. An oximeter measures oxygen levels in the body in about 40 seconds. I test a lot of people all day long. When I find somebody that's 89... I show them the 89 on the oximeter, and I say, it should be 98. You know, let's, let's fix it. Do you want to do something about it? Well, it's always low. And I said, you want to do something about it? Yeah, oh, yeah, I do. So I say, okay, breathe with me. You're going to breathe with me for eight minutes. You're going to do exactly what I do and exactly what I tell you to do. We sit and we breathe. We exhale completely, getting all the noxious, poisonous garbage gases out of our lungs, and we inhale, and we do that continually, comfortably, slowly, and deeply for eight minutes. I then slip the oximeter on again, take another reading, and very rarely is it not 98. So it shows the person they're in control of oxygen levels, at least the basic oxygen levels that we should be experiencing. And if they do those breathing techniques during the day, I'd say half a dozen or more times, what it does is it helps increase their oxygen levels on a practical level at the moment, but it also conditions them to breathe better. So that's one way. Another way is to um, use a supplement. Uh, there are some stabilized oxygen supplements that you can buy at the health food store, and you put so many drops in water and you drink it, and that will help to elevate your oxygen levels. Um, but that al along with breathing is wonderful. Um, and if you take a nice long walk, you'll notice you're breathing more because your body requires more oxygen. So there's an automatic reaction. If you go up a couple flights of stairs, uh, you start to breathe a little bit more. That's why exercise is so important, not only from a cardiovascular standpoint and a muscular standpoint and a neurological standpoint, but from the standpoint of uh, increasing oxygen levels. What kind of exercise do you do these days? I walk a lot. I walk a lot, and I love to um, use strength-building machines. I, I go to a place called, uh, it's, it's called Slow, Slow Exercise, and they're, uh, they're, they're weight-balanced machines that you use very slowly, but they build a lot of strength. Interesting. And then, of course, breathing exercises are very important to me. You're pretty advanced. I did a whole show on breathing last year. I have a feeling that the shallow breathing is also part of why we can't get rid of a lot of fat in our bodies. We don't have enough oxygen in the body. To do well, it. that's true. Movement also. And, of course, what we put in our mouths is just, I don't, I don't even want to say the word that I think it is because it's gross. But uh, we, we let too much stuff in our mouth. Uh, we don't consume enough oxygen, and you're right on there. Oxygen is very, very important. Uh, a stabilized, constant supply rather than going up and down. If you depend on uh, taking a long walk to bring oxygen into your body, that oxygen is going to be metabolized from the walk. You have to have something going on to keep those oxygen levels up. And what is that exactly? Are you talking about the drops? I'm talking about breathing more than anything. Yeah. Breathing more than anything. And then there's another problem. You open Pandora's box here. There's another problem uh, that occurs at night with lack of oxygen, and it's called sleep apnea, and that is a killer. That's a killer. Um, for some reason, uh, many people just don't breathe well. There's an obstruction of airflow from the outside into the body, through the lungs, into the blood. 
and it's usually some kind of breathing uh, disorder. It can, it can be from weight. It can be from the size of the neck and the fat that's collapsing around when you sleep and uh, many, many things. But a sleep test, an overnight sleep test, you tell your doctor you need an overnight sleep test in which they measure your oxygen, your breathing, the flow of air through your nose. And uh, if, if you have sleep apnea, it can change your life to get a machine. It's an assist machine that helps you breathe at night, and it is really fantastic. That's great. In one of your talks, you talked about William Campbell's book, Into the Light. I've mentioned him. Do you remember yeah. what that book's about? Well, yeah, it's, it's, kind of, uh, it's kind of far out in terms of, uh, of our concept of uh, what medicine is and psychology is and emotional aspects of things are. Um, but I'm into that. I'm reading a new one right now that's very similar on fear. These kinds of things we need to look at, but we need not to get crazy about them, you know. Talk about some of the other applications for coming into hyperbaric chambers that are specifically health-related, like people didn't need it for a disease or a major problem that they were aware of, but they went into a certain amount of treatments. And also I wanted to ask you the question, is this cumulative? In other words, how long does each hyperbaric treatment last? Well, that's the reason why I said every day is important, because if you don't go in the chamber every day, you can lose the effect. Um, one day maybe is okay, but uh, if you decide to go once a week, that's okay. It's better than nothing, but it isn't going to be the answer to uh, healing from a stroke or from cerebral edema or uh, even for anti-aging purposes. You have to go more often for a while. And there's a whole lot of things. Do you, do you want to know some of the things that we've treated in the past? Absolutely. And some of the things that are being treated around the world. See, in the United States, we're still a little bit uh, in the dark about uh, using hyperbarics for new things because the, the insurance companies uh, won't go along with it. And in, in the places where they have nationalized medicine, the countries are interested in finding solutions um, so they're willing to be open to this kind of thing. But I've been involved in the treatment of stroke, sudden deafness, compromised skin grafts, crush injury, which is a horrible thing. A lot of people during uh, big earthquakes uh, in Europe and Eastern Europe are treated in hyperbarics for crush injury. Post-traumatic cerebral edema, which is swelling around the brain, which is horrible. A lot of people go in just for anti-aging, and after a while they notice differences in their skin and in their whole metabolic system. Uh, decompression sickness is one of the first things hyperbarics ever treated, and that has to do with divers uh, getting the bends, which is an accumulation of uh, dissolved nitrogen in the body, which is, is deadly. It's horrible. Uh, wounds from bullets can be treated very well. Uh, delayed radiation injury, carbon monoxide poisoning, very, very easily uh, helped. Smoke inhalation injury. It's it's something very interesting to know that any kind of wounds that are not healing, any non-healing wound, should be treated with hyperbaric therapy, any non-healing wound. I think that's very important. Burns should be treated. Gangrene should be treated. Um, necrotizing soft tissue infection like uh, the flesh-eating bacteria. I have not personally seen anyone that we've treated with... Uh, with flesh-eating bacteria not heal. And you know, trench mouth and trench foot can be, can be uh, helped by hyperbarics. Uh, frostbite, cold injury can be helped by hyperbarics sooner the better. Uh, tinnitus uh, usually can help. Uh, there are a lot of problems with uh, the inner ear, and uh, tinnitus is one of them. Meniere's disease is pretty much closely related to that. I've seen them treated, and these are all covered in the International Textbook of Hyperbaric Medicine. Migraine headache and headaches in general can be treated. You have to kind of find a protocol that works for the patient because everybody's in kind of a different state. It's now being used to help kids with cerebral palsy and autism. It's not easy. That's, that's not an easy challenge, uh, but it can be very helpful, very, very helpful. How about people that turn their ankles walking or running? Yeah, any kind of sprain, anything like that. 
anything like that, post and pre-surgery, any kind of surgery, you should have hyperbaric couple.